All right, begin here in Nigeria, Africa's largest economy, critical transition year as far as leadership uh, of uh, the largest economy in Africa is uh, concerned. Uh, the next president sworn in May 29th is inheriting low revenues, high debt, high inflation, high unemployment. How does this all get addressed in a transition year and beyond and how can addressing it you know, be done accurately with data. Well, joining us to discuss further, Dr. Yemi Kale, partner, chief economist at KPMG Nigeria. From 2011 to 2021, he served as the statistician general of the Federation and chief executive officer of the National Bureau of Statistics. Dr. Kale, it is fantastic to have you. Good morning, sir. Thank morning, you for thank joining us. Morning, thank you for having me. Um, lots to discuss. Um, when you look at all the metrics out there that leadership is going to be coming into what does that mean for the economy as far as the transition year is concerned well very challenging um ordinarily typically in a transition year the government has the luxury of slowing down activities as the outgoing administration winds down and the new uh, incoming administration tries to settle in into government so the, the very little th activities occur in a transition um but because of the serious macroeconomic and social economic challenges that the economic community faces. Um, there's not, they don't have the luxury of that time, this time around. Uh, and it cuts across all the four sides of the, of the economy. In the real sector, household consumption is constrained, um, leading to slow, fragile growth. Uh, on average, since COVID, Nigeria has grown about 1%. And wow. if you compare that, that's on average. Wow. If you compare that with um, population growth of about 2.7% or, or labor force growth of about 3%, mm. it, it tells you what is going on with poverty, with unemployment, and so on. Um, you look at uh, the external sector, you have challenges with uh, the exchange rate, challenges with uh, foreign exchange accretion, arguably challenges with balance of payment trade balance. And then the fiscal that the new administration would, would, would hope that it would spend uh, out of these challenges. Is also having issues with inadequate revenues, um, very high debt, and more worrying, high debt service. Mm. So when you are looking at all that, it's a very, it's a very extremely challenging time, and um, very challenging. I don't think they're going to have the opportunity to settle down and take their time like they normally would do. Right, right. There is so much to discuss. Where to begin? Today's This Day newspaper a headline there, um, um, stakeholders, fuel subsidies, they are forecasting 750 naira per litre <laughs> fuel uh, if subsidies are removed. The pushback, though, uh, Dr. Kali, on subsidies. I got a, a WhatsApp message from one of our viewers, and I want, I want you to take a look at this, where uh, the message says the IMF and everyone saying remove fuel subsidies, thinking remove subsidy only has an impact, it would also have a social impact. Do you know how many school children would be out of school because they do not have enough transport fare to get to school, or perhaps some could apply to teachers? I don't know if you've heard sometimes recently of lecturers trying to embrace e-learning because of this petrol ha ha Also, uh, Dr. Kale, um, at the last um, MPC meeting, the Bureau, the, um, uh, doc, uh, the M governor of the the governor of the central bank, highlighted three... Um, supply shocks to food. He was talking about food inflation, one of which was the high cost of transportation. If you marry these two together, what, 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 what do we expect with, with this removal of fuel sources? And do you support it being removed? <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask you that as um, well. The way I like to approach such matters, particularly sensitive policy decisions, is to approach it from a purely technical point of view. Okay. Um, on emotional, uh, without the sound bites and mm. so on, and, and look at what is, and I think that's the way the conversation Nigeria has to have, look at this thing from a purely technical point of view and determine what is overall best for the country. Mm. And undeniably, removing subsidy will have, has significant economic costs. It has significant social costs, but keeping subsidy also has significant economic costs a significant social cost, even environmental cost. Um, so I don't like to look at these things uh, by focusing on uh, all the positives, like those that want to remove a subsidy would do and ignore or play down the negatives, or those that don't want subsidy to remove focus on all the negatives. I prefer looking at the whole, in a holistic, a holistic approach, look at the entire system and then determine what is overall best for the country. Because any policy, including this one, will have positives, it will have negatives, mm. it will, it will, some people will benefit and some people would uh, lose out from the policy. And at the end of the day, is the cost-benefit analysis to determine overall what is best for the economy. And for those that are going to lose, how can the, the, the government introduce palliatives to minimize the effects 
the negative effects of that policy. I think that's what the conversation we have to, to have. L let's be honest. I think it, it, we are getting to a point, if we're not already there, mm. that the conversation will not even be about should we remove um, subsidy. It will be subsidy has to be removed because we just can't pay for it right. any longer. Right. Uh, I would prefer that before we get there, we can actually discuss this so that the, proce the process of moving subsidies in the, is, 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 is well communicated and maybe in a well uh, phased approach. The truth of the entire thing is you and I benefit more from the subsidy than the poor that we like to um, say that uh, we are thinking about. Because mm. your consumption of fuel is a lot more from going from point A to B in your car mm. on your own is probably a lot higher than a poor man in a taxi with five people or in a bus with 20 people. Going from that same uh, 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 point A to point, point B, B. Yeah. His, his consumption per capita is a lot less. That's yeah. not saying that the impact is not going to be more on him. When you have a subsidy regime that uh, I think for, the, for, 2020, for six months in 2023 mm -hmm. is higher than your budget for health, for education and infrastructure combined, then we have to ask yourself if that is the best way, and that's the conversation we have in the country, if that's the best way, using your, uh, the person that sent the messages example, his fears are real. Right. However, I can always also argue that, well, if the government cannot, doesn't have enough resources to pay for teachers, or to pay them well, and teachers don't come to school at all, or they don't have enough resources to teach students, then the argument of, oh, we are worried that uh, the child might not be able to pay transportation costs to come to school completely doesn't matter anymore because mm. the child is not even in, in the classroom. So right. again, you have to look at everything in a holistic way and stop uh, focusing only on positives, only on negatives. I want to ask you about the size of, of government, this ongoing debates on whether government is too bloated and needs to be trimmed down on the, the other side. Here, here is an uh, excerpt of a, a chat we had with um, the um, uh, Ben Akabwezi, uh, Director General of the Budget Office. Here, here's what he said on, uh, on the size of, of government. Well, first of all, okay, um, the truth is the overall size of government is not over bloated government. However, it is true that in some cases, we have too many people in some jobs and we have too few people in other jobs. For instance, we have too, people, too few people in policing. But perhaps we have too many people in some administrative type jobs. So in aggregate, what we need to do is see how to rebalance this mix. But when we took the total number of federal government you know, employees, which is under, well under 1.5 million in the country, relatively speaking, when you compare to other nations, you know, this size, that's not too large a number. As I said, it's, it's the mix that is a problem. What do you, where, where do you fall in on this, on this debate on the size of Nigeria? Well, for, for someone that worked in government for quite a while. I agree with the, well, first of all, it, de it depends on your definition of um, whether the government is big or not. You can look at it, and this is the way I prefer to look at it in terms of the, the amount of involvement of government in the, in the system. How intrusive is government? How, does it, how much is it getting involved in private sector activities? Uh, in that sense, you can say, depending on the sector, government is too big or too small. For example, mm -hmm. in the entertainment industry, government is almost non-existent. So, you right. can't, so it depends on what you're looking at. Gotcha. But if you're looking at it in terms of what uh, the way the DG budget looked at it, in terms of the number, absolute number of staff in, um, in the public sector and the amounts that are, are allocated to them, I don't think it is, you can classify it as too big. And this is the, this, this, the absolute number of your staff is not what determines whether or not you are too big or too small, whether you are bloated or not. You can have 10 staff and you are over and you are over bloated mm -hmm. and you can have a million staff and you are not. So it depends on the amount of staff required to do the functions of that particular activity that determines whether you are too big or too small. Mm -hmm. Looking at 1.52 million public sector workers for the entire Nigerian system, I wouldn't say that they are, that is too big. I agree with him that you find situations where in certain areas there are a lot of people doing nothing and in other areas they don't have enough staff. Mm -hmm. So it's more of, he's right, it's more of a realignment issue but overall compared to uh, comparable countries with Nigeria Nigeria's numbers are not significant even in terms of the 
amount allocated to them. We, will, we only say that the amount allocated to them is too big because you are relative to capital. Right. So that's a revenue issue. If mm -hmm. you had enough money to boost, if your, revenue, if, your revenue, if your capital budget was now 20 billion, you wouldn't say the one or two billion allocated to salary is too big. But because there's not enough revenue, and, and of course, unfortunately, you can't do anything about salaries. You have to pay them. That's when all of a sudden revenue looks bigger than it really is. But I don't think it, I don't, I don't agree that it is. If you have the, for example, have the public sector um, and then increase their salaries related to what obtains in the private sector, the total wage bill will be higher than what it is mm, currently. Wow. So yeah. I don't agree that, um, uh, I, don't, I agree with the DG budget. I don't think the government in that regard, in terms of number of staff, is um, too big. Okay, um, oh no, I, I cannot have you on air without talking about inflation. I, I cannot. I need to ask you about um, the basket again. Here, here's another interview you had with uh, with uh, Bismarck Rowane when we're talking about the inflation basket and whether or not it reflects, you know, if the numbers 21.9 percent are, are correct. But this was about seven months ago. Let's take a listen to this as well. The inflation basket is supposed to be reconstituted every five years. Naturally, your behavioral patterns, your your, your demography. Mm. Your, in fact, your life expectancy and all of that. Yeah. So the last time changes over time. Mm. Therefore, you need to reflect that in terms of changing your consumer basket. Okay. Uh, even if it's just tweaking it a little bit. Mm. But the last time we did that was 2009. So quite frankly, going by the five-year cycle, we are due for a third review. Mm. But we haven't done anything about yeah. it. Yeah. So, you know... Um, your response, are we, are inflation figures, do we need to rejig the basket? Are the numbers where they are now reflective of where costs are? Statistical methodology has to be reviewed uh, every now and then. Mr. Okay. Rewani is correct and wrong. It's correct in the sense that yes, the, the CPI is based on household consumption of 2009, it's outdated. Um, but he's wrong when he says nothing has been done about it mm. because I know fully well that just before I left, we had completed the process of um, reweighting the CPI using the more uh, the, 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 the more updated consumption basket. And yes, there are some changes in the weights. For example, the weight for telecommunications uh, is much higher. The weight, even the weight for food eating outside the, of, of the home was much higher. Transportation was higher. So yes, that affects the um, the, the 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 food basket that will affect overall inflation. So mm. yes, I wouldn't say that current inflation rate is a hundred percent accurate because the, um, the basket has changed. Um, but I know that, like I said, just before I left, we had completed the process of reweighting. We're almost at the process of starting the testing. Uh, so I expect that the NBS probably would, I'm not sure why it hasn't come out yet, but probably would probably publish the, re the, the new weights anytime soon. But uh, statistical methodology would tell you that when you have such a big change, you're supposed to test the new weights for a while mm. with the old weights to ensure there are no problems. Some people even advocate up to a year. Mm. So maybe that's the stage that the, uh, the bureau is currently, and I expect that so probably sometime this year, they would probably, because it's been about two years now, they probably will come up with a new weight. But no, things, were, things have been done. Before Mr. Rewani complained about it, they were working on that, so mm. that's not correct. But yes, he's right that the inflation rate might not uh, reflect, uh, completely reflect current activities because the basket is outdated. Okay, so now, 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 still on the inflation, how do we bring it down? With, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sorry to throw that at you, but how, how do we, how, yes, what's, what's the answer there? Um, how you take down your inflation would depend on, would, it, would be determined by what is causing the inflation in the first place. And inflation is, is either caused, as you know, by demand pull factors or by cost push factors. Mm. I believe that uh, it is probably more cost push factors in Nigeria, but cost push factors are not things that you can do, they're not short-term measures, they are things involving the cost of production, uh, infrastructure deficits, uh, exchange, cost of inputs, cost of, uh, of financing, things of that nature. Um, I think it's a combination of both. Now, on the, one, on, on, on the demand pool side, the argument is too much cash chase, chasing um, too few goods. Too few goods. Yeah. We have to be very, uh, but there are two sides of the equation, there's cash and there's output. We have to be sure that the problem is a cash, excessive cash, it's supposed to be um, excess cash. I have too much money, I'm not buying things I don't need. But if it is a situation where it is output, so let me give you an ex a very simple example. I need to buy five bottles of water to feed the five members in my family. Mm. I go to the market, I only see three bottles of water. Sure. The price goes up. Right. Now, I don't have excess cash. Mm. I'm going to use the same amount of money to buy, and maybe because the price goes up, I can buy only two. So I'm going to buy two bottles of water to feed, to feed my five 
children in the house. That's, I don't have excess cash. I just can't. So that issue is not trying to pull my cash. It should be trying to pull my cash out of the system because mm -hmm. my cash is not causing the problem. It's the lack of output causing the problem. So even in the demand pool, what we do most of the time, we try and pull out cash from the system. We have to be sure that that's what's creating the problem, excess cash. I don't think that's excess cash. I think it's usually most of it. In Nigeria's case, it's likely an output problem. You have to ramp up output because food inflation, which is usually what um, it, it more of a bigger challenge for the poor, mm -hmm. I don't think the poor have excess, and that's yeah. what is driving inflation. So it's more of an output issue. On the, on the cost push side, I don't really think there's much monetary policy can do about that. It's just about long-term development uh, plans, improve your ease of doing business, fix infrastructure, fix security. Anything that pushes up cost of production and distribution is, good, is, going to, is going to keep inflation high, regardless of what you do in terms of pulling cash out of the system. Mm. Well, speaking of cash, uh, the Naira redesign, the cash scarcity we've seen, how do you see that impact on the first quarter? Almost at the end of March, so Q1 is about to be on. How, how do you see the impact? Well, on I, I made a comment on this recently. I believe that in the first uh, quarter, uh, the economic provider has, provider has lost about 10 trillion um, naira, and I estimated it based on the model I've been using since I was at the, at the NBA. Mm. By the one I say 10 trillion, I don't mean it's going to shrink. Right. It is, for example, you were expecting the Q1 GDP to grow from, say, um, 40, 44 trillion to uh, 54 trillion. Uh, so it is 10 trillion minus that 54 trillion that you were expecting. So mm. instead, it has gone to. 40, well, 40, 48 has gone from 44 to 40, 40, 46 mm -hmm. rather than 44 to 54. You know okay. what I mean? So, yeah. that's, so, the, so nominal GDP might still grow. It's just that it will not grow as much as you would have grown without those um, constraints. But that's still a big problem because your real GDP is deflated. Uh, and when, when you do that, it might slow growth. I'm mm -hmm. expecting a, I, I, I'll be surprised if GDP grows more than 2% in the first quarter. I'm actually expecting something between 1% and 1.5%. And wow. that's even as you mean the oil sector uh, picks up as it's doing. If the oil sector does not pick up, it might even be less than 1% because the economy is, the economy is significantly dependent on ca the cash economy. And even the formal sector that doesn't really, the formal sector itself also has a huge cash component. Mm. Even those that do their transaction through electronic means also had uh, uh, challenges as well. Uh, using that portal. Yeah. People that need to buy inputs, whether in cash or electronic transactions, had problems. So there, there was a whole lot going on in that first quarter. So I, like I said, I expect, if I see anything more than 2%, I'll be really surprised. Mm. Um, speaking of something that's been growing at barely 2%, manufacturing, I think manufacturing sector Q4, it did just barely above 2 What? what, what's, what how do we get, um, do we need, does manufacturing in Nigeria need an overhaul? How do we get more output from there? Um, I try again. I don't like to look. I don't like to focus on manufacturing. Is very important. Yeah, we need to grow our manufacturing. There's no doubt about that. There's a lot of benefits in addition to its conserves foreign exchange, employment generation, and so on. But in terms, what was the objective of manufacturing? The job, the, the the objective of manufacturing is not to create jobs. Creating jobs is like a by a byproduct, a benefit of manufacturing. The objective mm -hmm. of manufacturing: people manufacture to sell their products. Uh, and to sell your product, you are competing with other people also producing their products. So if you check the way global manufacturing occurs today, more, the, more value comes from the technology, the patent, and the distribution, marketing, and branding um, sides of the entire process are not really from the actual uh, manufacturing process. That's mm -hmm. why you see many countries happy to outsource the manufacturing process to other countries because yeah. that's actually the smallest part and that's one that gives them the first value. Now, most in Nigeria can do that. I'm just saying that we have to focus on the other two parts because if you don't do that, your objective at the end of the day when you produce the goods is to sell it. Mm -hmm. If you are not able to convince consumers that you're, 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 you are producing something that they need that nobody else can do, in which case patent, or you are producing it at a, you are producing it at better quality or you are producing it cheaper, then you will not be able to sell those products. And that's where your branding, marketing, technology, patent comes in. If you cannot sell those products, at the end of the day, your, your manufacturing company will collapse because you can't sell these products right. and then all the benefits of exchange rate and employment go. So foc as you are building your factories and your, and your industry, focus also on the important um, aspect of technology, mm -hmm. of branding, of sales, of marketing, because mm -hmm. that's where most of the value comes. So much to ask you. I'm trying to rifle through all these uh, as quickly as possible. Debts, Dr. Kali, debts, debts, debts. Um, I, I'm sure, you know, with where things are now, from ways and means to, you know, where Nigeria's debt, I think, what was it, 
um, 44 trillion or so. That's as of September 2022, looking at total debt. Then you've got ways and means over 22 trillion. Well, I mean, it's how are you assessing this debt and how we can pare that down? Well, they always say debt is not, uh, is not, a cha is not the problem, but mm. the ability to pay the debt is always the problem. Yeah. We have significant problems paying our debt. Um, and that's, that's why when people, like the Minister of Finance, say we don't have a, uh, a debt the problem, problem where people get problem. upset. But I understand what she means. Yeah. If the debt to GDP is low, it means there's a lot of revenue in GDP that is not being collected. That's mm. why your debt to GDP is low. Right. Uh, so if your debt to GDP is low and your debt to revenue is, is high, it's because you're not collecting enough revenue from that GDP that you have. Mm. And, lightly, and that's likely because the informal sector, which is about 40% of the economy, is more or less not paying tax directly to government. If you, even if you, let's look at, uh, look at the, let's look, use Lagos as an example. Yeah. 60 or 60, almost 70% of Lagos is, and has the biggest IGR, mm. comes from pay as you earn. That's, right. just, that's because it's a system to pull that money out automatically. Mm. Mm. But you gotta look at the, uh, assessments, uh, you know, that was uh, what, what, the, what people, what self-employed people say they owe in taxes. It's one of the smallest components of their total idea. Mm. And this is despite the fact that that sector is 40% of the economy. Oh, the economy right, so clearly right. there's a lot of money in that area mm. that you can pull out. And if you do that, your debt to GDP ratio will go up and your debt to revenue ratios will improve. But the problem is there's a lot of untaxed and uh, there's a lot of revenue out there that the government is unable to pull in. Mm. Wow, wow, wow. Um, poverty, multi-dimensional poverty. The Bureau of Statistics put out this uh, that report showing about 63% of the population is facing it, which is about 132, 133 million people. Um, how, and yes, another another uh, hurdle for the country. How, how do we bring this, this, this uh, number down? Well, first of all, we have to understand that multidimensional poverty is not, uh, is different from income poverty. Income poverty just focusing on uh, uh, dollar ID and whether you have absolute poverty, whether you have enough money to buy, a, a min minimum amount of uh, goods and services to consume. Mm. Multidimensional poverty is more of a development uh, indicator because it includes, in addition to income poverty, health, education, security, and all those other things. If you want to bring down, and the, the, uh, you, you start with economic growth. Economic growth on its own is not going to bring back poverty. Mm. But the link, the, the idea is as your economy is growing, it means that people are getting richer because people, economy is growing means businesses are provide, producing more goods and services because there's a demand for it. And if there's an increase in demand for it because people are getting richer. Um, and if people are getting richer, that's, that, that's obviously improving poverty. By the way, that depends on the distribution of, if that increase in income and increase in, um, uh, in growth is being equitably distributed. Mm. If it is, if only a few people are benefiting from that increase in income, then the economic growth is not even benefiting. So it's inclusive not growth. Inclusive, is inclusive growth, yes. Okay, okay. Once the economy is now growing, how it links to multidimensional poverty is the ability of the government to tax that increase in wealth of individuals and businesses, and then pull that money into health, education, which are the other parts of the multidimensional, improve health and, the health and, and education and other security indicators under multidimensional poverty, and via economic growth, you pull up everything. Until you do that, your income poverty um, would be, remain poor, mm. and your multidimensional poverty will continue to, to remain poor. You have to improve education, you have to put health, you have to put security, income distribution, and all the other things that make up the multidimensional poverty index. Otherwise, it, it will keep being uh, as bad as it is. Uh, let me quickly squeeze in the exchange rates. Um, I, I would assume, I want to get your thoughts, the multiple windows, getting a single exchange rate, and then whether or not you can, you know, that is, it would, would move further this year. How, how do you see the, I guess, the, the exchange rate for the nation, you know, working out as far as this, this year is concerned? I guess, do we need more exports to bring that down if we're selling more stuff overseas or maybe selling more oil? The best way to um, have a more stable exchange rate is to sell more. Right, and just, sell more stuff. just to sell more, you have to produce. That's why I was talking about competitive, co be more competitive, whether it's goods, whether it's services. Mm. You just have to sell, you just have to find a way of selling more. Um, at the same time, ensuring more effective or efficient utilization of whatever reserves that you have, creating the environment that brings in capital. And we're also having challenges with that. Capital importation is slowing down, foreign mm. direct is slowing down. You have to do things that bring in. Um, foreign exchange the country, that's export and that's investment. You mm. have to find a way to ramp it up. Uh, until you do that, you continue to struggle. The multiple, I don't think there's anybody that, or most people don't believe that having multiple exchange rates is the most efficient thing to do. Mm. Uh, maybe these are things that we just have to do because of the peculiar state of the Nigerian economy, but 
it's not efficient. The more efficient way is to focus on policy that drag brings in more, more foreign capital. Um, Dr. Keller, we started off talking about the challenges. Is there any optimistic, because we've talked about one challenge after another over the last half hour. Is there any optimistic outlook on the economy, with, or at least for the transition that we're looking at over the next four, eight years, however things can work out? What's well, it's not, it's not, I, I would, I, I wouldn't want to, um, any, a, a new government is coming in. Mm. Um, we've, we've heard what they want to do. Most of the things we have read sound pretty, pretty interesting and sound. Mm. If it is done, then I think there's some positives. If it, those things that uh, are the incoming administration say they want to do uh, is done, then I think there are some um, positives for the economy. I don't think those positives will be in 2023. Mm. <laughs> <I think laughs> right. And there are lots of uh, bills that the outgoing administration introduced, for example, the constitutional reforms in terms of electricity and so on. So again, these are medium to longer term benefit. So there are signs of positives, mm. um, not in 2023. So again, if all these things are done properly, I think that we have a chance to fix a lot of these macroeconomic uh, Im and social imbalances. And maybe you have to also add that the global economy itself is going through a lot. It's not just Nigeria right. going through a lot of, of pressure right mm. now. Mm. Um, people are even talking about the possibility of a global recession. I'm probably one of the few people that disagrees. Mm. What I see is people are looking at the growth rate went from 6 to 3 to 2.7. Oh, it's slowing down. I don't see that. Mm. All I see is a correction since COVID because if you check the pre-COVID growth rates, they were around 2.5 to 2.7%. Right. So I don't know why 2.7% forecast is not considered. Sudden. It's because they're looking at it from a higher growth rate. Well, that higher growth rate was because of a, a correction from COVID. So mm. I'm, I'm a minority in not believing that the, economy, the global the economy is going to enter a recession. Nevertheless, we still have all those issues that Nigeria has to contend with. But I see, assuming the things that, assuming the incoming administration focuses on the things that they say they want to do, they get the right people in the right places, give the people the free um, hand to do what they need to do, mm. and access to the president so that they can get things moving. I think those three things are, it's not about selecting a very intelligent minister. Yeah. It's also allowing that intelligent minister to work, to work and as well as giving him access. Mm. So if he needs to get you to do something, to sign something, approve something, you don't have to wait for one month to access the president. So once those three things are in place, mm. then you might see more positive change. So I, I, I would always be positive, optimistic about my country, especially since the things I'm hearing that we want to do mm. uh, are positive. Yeah. And I'll wait to see whether they are done or, um, or not. And I think that will determine what, what's going to happen in the future. Fascinating four years ahead. Uh, Dr. Yemi Kali, Chief Economist, partner at KPMG Nigeria. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me.